thing here. Hey, Natasha, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Orr. We are today going to talk about ACLs. I'm going to go over the basics of what the ACL is, how it works, how it helps us function, how we can injure it, and if we do injure it, what we can do about that. So let's get started with this. So number one, how do you injure these things? Some of these slides might take a minute to, to play. So ACLs, pretty fragile, pretty fragile parts of your knee. So first let's talk about what your ACL is and what it does. All right, so where's your ACL live? It lives in your knee, okay? And if you look on Wikipedia, you can get a pretty basic idea of, it goes from the back of your femur, it goes to the front of your tibia, the schematic right here. And it basically will control how your knee moves and keeps it stable. So the main function that we think when we think of an ACL, it keeps your knee from sliding forward. It keeps the tibia from going forward on the femur. So again, with this drawing, you can see, if you can see my cursor here, it goes from the back of the femur down to the front of the tibia. And you can see how that would, you can imagine, that would keep the tibia from sliding forward. Here's another view of it. Your normal ACL is on the left. You see this ligament coming from the back of the femur over to the tibia there. All right. And then this will typically tear. It can tear in the middle like this schematic here. It can tear up high. It can tear down low. So when it tears, then we're going to have some dysfunction going on in the knee. Another thing the ACL will do that's not as commonly thought of is it also will help control some rotation. Here's a schematic showing in the middle, your ACL in a neutral position. So it's going from the back to the front, kind of we talked about. It can, if the knee rotates out, it doesn't put a lot of stress on the ACL, but if your tibia rotates inwards, you can see how that tibia starts, or that ACL starts to get stretched. And that will put more stress on it and it'll put more force and that also will get it prone to, to tear. So not only does the tibia or the ACL control your tibia from sliding forward, it also prevents your tibia from rotating inwards. So it does two different, it controls two different motions. So you're out having a fun day, you have a fall, you have a twist, you feel a pop, what exactly happened to your knee, all right? How do ACLs tear? So when we look at the mechanics and the forces across your knee, you think of the axis of mechanical force, which goes down the leg along with the anatomic force. Your ACL on this view, again, is going from the back to the front and your quad tendon and your patellar tendon along your kneecap right here doesn't just get your tibia to go up and down, also will pull it a little bit forward. So that will start to put stress on your ACL. So for example, if you're playing a game of basketball and you try to stop with your leg out in front of you, that is going to contract your quad, draw the tibia forward, and that will put stress across your ACL. And this is that schematic broken down again. When your leg is straight up and down, your femur is resting right on your tibia and the forces are fairly neutral. When your leg is in front, your tibia will start to slide forward and that will start to put more stress on your ACL as well. Here's our skiing schematic here. We're playing across. So why do we injure our, our ACL when we're skiing? Because we're not playing basketball. We're not trying to put our foot out in front of us and try to stop. So it's not that Tibby is sliding forward when we're skiing. It's more that rotation that we lose control of when we're skiing. So if we watch the schematics broken down with this, with this uh, knee, it's, it's out to the side, and then you can see how it starts to twist, but we're doing one, five, one, one, two, and three. And you can see how this knee is starting to twist in right here, and that will put the knee into a, a bad position again with the tail of the ski, and we'll show that in a second. So mechanics of an ACL with skiing, as you are coming around a turn and your ski is coming to the inside, your knee starts to turn and that is going to cause that the ACL to pop when your leg twists like that. If you look at it from the side, you can see it a little bit better. And on this next slide, 
you get an idea that the front of the ski is over here, the back of the ski is over here. And as it contacts the ground, the ground pushes the back of the ski out, which pushes the front of the ski in and rotates the tibia inwards. And again, that will put stress on your ACL. So that's why with skiing, we get more of a twist mechanism as opposed to basketball, soccer, running exercises where you'll get more of a out front or anterior uh, mechanism. Again, with skiing, your ACL, when it's stretched, is at, is in trouble. And the times when your ACL is at the most vulnerable position is if your leg is fully extended. So kind of going over the top feeling when you can fall over the front of the skis or over the front of the snowboard. Or if you're in the back seat and you sit down, you hyperflex. So hyperextension or hyperflexion, either one will put your ACL in a bad position and make it more prone to having an injury. This is just a schematic from the 1980s. I just really like the drawings. So, but this does show the principle that over here with the knee hyperextended with the guy in the air coming down in the back seat when he lands. And this drawing over on the right will show that that down, that uh, uphill ski that he's falling back on is twisting on him. And that again is going to rotate the knee and put that ACL stretch and risk injury to it. Video plan. Lindsey Vaughn trying to find the perfect grip and trying to chase down Tina Maze, redefine the season that Maze is having by saying, I wasn't there when you took over the overall race. What this is Vaughn, uh, first run back from an ACL injury that she had before that she recovered from. This is the woman here with the most Super G wins of any woman in history and 59 World Cup wins total. When she wants something, look out. So many traps in this course with the conditions. Vaughn right now, 400s to work with. Beautiful set of turns there. Were they too perfect again? Cross. Stepping down, so the and now has dropped back. And you can see again ski catches, and you have that twist. So you had a nice day, you had an injury, you felt an injury to your knee. Now, what do we do about it? <clears throat> So a lot of what we do is evidence-based. So there's a lot of studies with ACLs and we have a lot of data to support what we do and what we don't do, right? So a lot of the stuff that we'll talk about now in terms of how do we diagnose, manage and treat ACL injuries, a lot of this is driven by, by data. So we'll go over through this as we go. And when we talk about summary recommendations, we talk about strong recommendations, moderate recommendations, fairly low evidence recommendations, kind of just, uh, you know, I do what I feel recommendations where not very evidence supported. So number one, how do you even know what's going on? Okay, how do you know this is an ACL tear? All right, so first off, what we'll do in an office, if we see someone with an injury is we will start a physical exam. And the easiest things to do with an ACL is to see if that tibia is translating forward on the femur. So you can do an anterior drawer test where the knee is flexed up and you just pull the tibia forward and see how much it's moving. You have a good comparison with the other leg as long as that's not injured as well. So we can get a fairly good idea of how much that tibia is moving. Another one's called the Lachman test. We'll do this with the leg slightly straighter because that'll offload the uh, medial meniscus in the knee. So then you'll get a little bit of, uh, sometimes you'll get a more sensitive exam doing that. And another thing we can do is we can actually recreate that internal twisting of the tibia as well, this one is a little bit more difficult to do because it hurts. So we typically will not routinely do that in the office, but in surgery before we do anything, we'll typically do these tests as well. And when the patient is asleep, we'll get a much more accurate study because no one is tense, they're not guarding, and you can have a little bit more accurate how much is the ligament stretching or is it holding firm. And this just gives you an idea that what's gonna be the most sensitive, what's gonna be the least sensitive, and again, yeah, you just sort of get an idea of how accurate these tests are. So you come in, you do the tests, you get suspicious that there's an ACL tear. The recommendation at that point is to get an MRI. We don't just jump into surgery. We want to confirm what we found. So we'll get an MRI before we do anything invasive. 
Here's an MRI. So this is what we call sagittal view or a view from the side. You can see your femur up top, tibia down below, your kneecap or your patella is over on the side there. So that's the front of the knee. Here's the back. And on the left MRI, you can see an intact ACL. It goes from the back of the femur to the front of the tibia. You see a nice dark line. All right. Over on the left or on the right side, you'll see that that is completely absent. You don't see that. So that's a torn ACL, which will confirm what we see. Now, with YouTube, can you do this on your own? Sure, you can. And they do say that 85% of the time, you'll get 100% of the time, which brings up a well-known movie quote, which, you know, in real life, we're going to try to avoid. So it's much better to go and get an actual MRI rather than looking on YouTube. So you came in the office, did an exam, got an MRI, ACL's torn, what do we do? All right, do we need to do a surgery on this or do we not need to do a surgery on this? Which brings us back to evidence medicine. So the strong recommendation is for young active adults, and define young as under 35, but really in Tahoe, that's closer to 55, 65, because there's more 65-year-olds who are more active than 35-year-olds in other places. So I, I do tend to extend these recommendations a little bit up the chain rather than what they say here. But the evidence does support that if you're active, your ACL should be functioning. And there's a recommendation to go towards surgery. And when do you do surgery? They'll typically say within five months uh, because you'll start to have altered mechanics and you'll start having more wear and tear in your knee without if you wait longer. Doesn't mean you can't, doesn't mean people don't, but the recommendation is to get it done sooner rather than later. So how do we do this? I'm going to go over how I do it. There's multiple different ways to take care of these, right? The main option is to use your own tissue, which is an autograph, or to use cadaver tissue, which is an allograft. Okay, so whether you're using your own or you're borrowing it from someone else. If you're using your own, there's these three main areas. You can take it from your quad tendon, your patellar tendon, and your hamstring tendon. Personally, I like using the quad tendon graft. If you're using cadaver tissue, you also can use your tibialis anterior, you can use your tibialis posterior, you can use your Achilles tendon, you have a few different options. I still like using the quadriceps tendon graft, even if you're using cadaver tissue as well. I think it's just, it's a good graft to use, and we'll go over why. Quickly, how do we take a quad tendon if we're going to take your own? If it comes from a cadaver, it's already pre-set up for you, you don't have to harvest anything. If you're taking your own, we'll make a linear incision on your knee. It's usually between three and five centimeters long. There's evidence there. And you can see your quad tendon down below. We'll take the central eight to nine to 10 millimeters of quad tendon, which is really turned into about 20% or so of the quad, which is a smaller percentage than other parts of the knee. And this just shows that we'll tag it with a suture. You can see that nice delineated tendon right there. And you can harvest it this way. Another way we can do this is we'll use what's called a uh, quadriceps harvester. It's a nice tube that'll give you a nice round graft. And then you use kind of like a cigar cutter to cut that off at the end. And it inserts just like this. This is, shows the transverse incision. I to use a longitudinal incision, which is just a difference of opinion. This is your graft when you're done. As you, when you take it out, it's close to 70 millimeters in length. This is how we'll prepare it. So we'll make marks and we'll put sutures through it. This is a little bit of a busy slide, but basically shows you that we put a bunch of suture into the graft. Here it is a little bit further. And then here's our finished product right here. So we have sutures on either side of it that are leading off. And those sutures leading off, we'll put those into buttons. Here's an example of a button right here. Now, this is an older model of a button. It's one solid loop. You can't tighten it or lengthen it if you want to. The button on this side, you can see if you pull on it, you can make this shorter or longer. So you can adjust the length of it, which lets you have a little bit more play when you're deciding how tight or how loose you want your ACL graft to be in a knee. You can, if you make it too tight, you're going to lose motion. If you make it too loose, you're going to lose stability. So there's a sweet spot between the two and every patient's a little different on how tight or how loose you want to make it so that you have good function. So that's something that having this being adjustable really gives us another tool to make this an accurate and successful surgery. This is what it'll look like once you put it into the knee. On the left, this is what we call suspensatory fixation. So there's sutures on either side 
and the buttons go on the outside cortex of the knee. These are very small, flat buttons. They're made out of titanium. They're very strong, and they basically just sit outside there. Very low profile. To people typically do not get bothered by these. Another way of doing it is you can put screws into the knee. These screws can be metal. They can also be a very uh, specialized form of plastic. And there's no difference between the two as far as outcomes are concerned. So again, this is the difference of opinion. The studies don't really back up one way versus the other. So what other things can we do that are coming into vogue? So a um, low extraarticular tenodesis. Again, when we talked about the tib the ACL, it functions to help prevent the tibia from rotating inwards. And that can be difficult for the ACL to do that by itself in the middle of the knee. So what we can do is we can add a little bit of an extra help to it by putting on the outside of the knee. We'll tack some of your IT band down onto the femur, and that will help control the tibia from rotating in. And that will help uh, show that there's less laxity with moving forward, less laxity with rotation. We won't always do these. We will do these for uh, patients who have more instability in their knee. So if we don't see a lot of rotational instability in the knee, we don't always have to do these. So this is a case-by-case -case basis with patients. In addition, you don't always have to reconstruct your ACL. You can also repair it. This has gotten more traction over the years. Now, repairing an ACL is less invasive. You don't have to drill a tunnel into the knee. You don't have to do quite as much work. However, historically, ACL repairs have a higher re-rupture rate. Now that is improving with increased and improved techniques. Um, and for example, we'll now augment that repair with some internal suture, which is what we call an internal brace. Now that is some suture coming down here. You see it spans from that button on the cortex of the femur, and it comes down across where you repaired your ACL here, and you'll put it down into a little anchor down in the tibia. So the ACL is repaired itself, and you also have helped support it with putting some extra suture in there as well. And that has helped decrease through rupture rates and improving ACL repairs. Another way of helping your ACL repairs is something called a bare implant. So bare stands for... Um, bridge enhanced ACL repair. So you're making a bridge, which is a big piece of sponge that you'll put some highly specialized concentrated blood into. And then that will help bridge and create a scaffold for your ACL, not only to heal, but also grow. And that is coming out with more data as well. That's It's only a few years old. Long-term studies are still coming out, but this is uh, another option that we have that we can do for people. If you have enough residual ACL from the tear, we can try to do a repair and we can put this bare implant into it and that will help augment and improve our repair. All right, so the surgery part is done. We reconstructed either using allograft, autograft, or a repair. We did an LET or lateral extraarticular tenodesis as well. We either use screw fixation, suspensatory fixation, Every time we do a surgery, it's very patient specific. So how we do it, it depends on everyone who we're working on. But you're asleep during the surgery. So now it's time for you to get to work. So what do we do or what can we expect after surgery? Okay. And there's several questions that we'll go over. So number one, when are we going to be out of pain? Okay. When can I stop taking pain medication? Most people stop taking pain medication in one to two weeks. There's a pretty steep drop off of how many people are taking pain medications after two weeks. Now, some people have residual discomfort. If the knee's a little stiff, the knee's a little sore, if they need a little bit more pain medication, that's okay. But typically after the first few weeks, the number of people who need to take pain med medication is pretty minimal. Off of crutches, also typically one to two weeks, sometimes three. This is, I believe this is uh, old over here, but no, usually we'll have people off crutches after about two weeks if it's just an ACL. If we have to do anything more with the knee, such as a meniscus injury, things, something like that, that will skew how long we're on crutches for. All right, returning to school, you kids usually can just get out of school for a week, sometimes two if your parents are nice. But after that, you can be back in school. How about uh, returning to work? Same thing. One to two weeks, people are typically back at work, especially if it's a more sedentary, lets you sit down type of job. If it's a more exertional job, you might have to be out for a little bit longer. Or if you do return to work, you'll have more restrictions on what you're allowed to do. 
the main tenant for going back to work or going back to school or going back to activities is if you're going to have a surgery and go through the rehab, we want to try to go through this once. So we're going to limit activities to ensure or to try to ensure as much as we can that we're going through this one time. Return to driving, usually a couple weeks. So that can be two weeks. It can be four weeks. We'll tell people that you can drive when you feel that's safe to do so. But it's not about being able to hit the gas. It's about being able to hit the brakes. So when the puppy runs in the street, you need to be able to stop in time. And that can be the more difficult thing to do. So that's the where we want people to feel comfortable with doing that. So therapy. Physical therapy is important. You cannot do a surgery. It doesn't matter how good of a job of a surgery it is. If you don't do therapy and work on your motion, work on strength, work on function, we're not going to have the result that we're looking for. So therapy is a very important part of this whole process as well. And that's another recommendation that is that we have is that, yes, we do recommend people go to physical therapy. So <clears throat> what type of therapy are you going to do? This just gives you a normal guideline. Stationary bike, and these all are kind of a range of numbers here. So stationary bike, typically about two weeks, but anywhere between zero, you know, right away and about eight weeks. Same thing with a normal gait. Some people have a pretty normal gait right away. Usually around two weeks, you'll have a, you know, pretty steady gait, and it can take up to eight to 10 weeks as well. Getting on the elliptical, sorry, getting your, your heart rate up. Median time of six weeks, sometimes a little bit earlier, maybe a little bit later. Uh, stair climber, fairly similar. Swimming, fairly similar. We like people to wait, be out of the water for at least a month after surgery, so you're not soaking your incisions. Uh, <clears throat> straight line jogging, typically we'll have people doing that at about the three-month mark. Maybe a little bit earlier, but not often. Uh, that's my own personal opinion with that. Uh, jumping, similar idea. Um, <clears throat> cutting, pivoting, so getting back to side to side, more sport-specific activity. That's usually about four and a half months, give or take. And then agility, sports-specific drills, things like that. It's a very similar timeline. And then returning to sports, typically about six months. <clears throat> so some studies with, with rehab. And rehab has really picked up quite a bit because there's always a push to get people back, get people stronger. We want to go, go, go. Similar with Aaron Rodgers talking about coming back to the NFL after his Achilles rupture. Everyone wants to push the envelope on when they can return. So there is... Certainly a lot of pressure on therapists to get people better. And in the age of Instagram, Facebook, the Twitter and all that, everyone can compare how they're doing to everyone else, which we will always tell everyone to ignore because number one, people aren't entirely honest about how well they're doing. And two, everyone is different. Some people might have a different type of surgery than someone else that doesn't always get brought to light. So the number one principle with therapy, we don't always just go on a timeline. We do pro progress patients when they're ready to progress. So it doesn't matter if it's week or month three, you're not gonna jog until we have the motion down, we have the strength back, we have the flexibility. We, we don't just go off of numbers for this. We do encourage early weight bearing as long as there isn't any other injury in the knee, it's simply an ACL. Certainly getting on weight bearing fairly early is helpful. Uh, continuous passive motion. So CPM machines uh, were very popular once upon a time. They have not shown to have any improvement in outcome at the one year mark. And so insurances don't pay for them anymore. And they they, they aren't used anymore uh, at home. Sometimes in therapy sessions, the therapists will have them. They can use them there, but we don't prescribe uh, CPM machines anymore. This is what they look like. Very big, very bulky. Don't need them at home anymore. Uh, E-stems, again, it sounds like a good idea. You're just stimulating your muscles to fire. No long-term studies show that there's any significant benefit uh, to using them at home. You can certainly use them in the physical therapy office. This is what it looks like. You basically will stick electrodes on the leg and just zap your muscles. It is also good for, for animals as well in certain situations. Neuromuscular training, this is certainly helpful. So not only do you want to know, you know, that your legs are strong, you also want to have good connection with them. So you know where all your limbs are in space so that you can trust your feet without having to look at them all the time. And that takes a lot of time, and a lot of repetition volume to get to that stage. But that's certainly something that will help down the road. 
So accelerated rehab, accelerated rehab means we get you back at the six month mark. When people start to come back in under six months, that's when the risk of re-injury starts to go up and up. So we'll have a pretty strict, nothing sports specific until the six month mark. So now getting back and participating in sports with twisting and cutting and pivoting, things like that. So what are the therapists doing, right? You go there, you lay down, they torture you a lot, then they make you do exercises and then you have to go home. Not always the most fun experience, right? But it does pay off in, in the long run. So we, we do go off a lot on the US ski team, um, validated method of doing this. Again, you'll notice here that we have the prehab, um, early rehab, the training emphasis, um, return to sport emphasis, and then competition emphasis. So it's, you know, early rehab, then modified light training, then training and return to sport specific training, and then not just returning to your sport, but competing at a high, high level. Okay. And the first thing you'll notice here, there are not numbers, there are not weeks, there are not dates. This again is not driven by the number of weeks you're out from surgery. It's driven by how your progress is going. And this will just give you a general idea of initial rehab emphasis, so one, two, and three, and then modified training as we're getting stronger, three, four, and five, um, returning to snow or returning to sport, and then getting into competition. And this, you can go back and forth. It's not always a linear straight line. So there is some accommodation for, do we have some backtracks here and there? That can happen. So accelerated rehab protocol, this will give you some, some basic ideas. So pre-surgical prehab, so prehab meaning that you're going in before your surgery. Um, <clears throat> and that's basically getting oriented with your physical therapist, making sure that you like them, that they like you. Not everybody gets along. And I do think it's important that if you don't feel comfortable with the therapist you're working with, you do have that time that if you want to see someone else or talk with them constructively, hopefully, about what your goals are and what you would like to be back to doing. So that's a fairly straightforward, more of a conversation than anything else. Uh, early phase, uh, the first one to two weeks, what we're looking for is some early range of motion, early weight bearing, and getting the swelling out of the knee and really starting to get that quadriceps to fire. So some very basic, easy things that we want people to start working on. This is a little bit of a busy slide right here. Uh, weeks two to four. Uh, we start really emphasizing that quad working. We want to start working on that motion more and getting that leg just more active. So our goals here, range of motion, zero to 120 degrees. That's what we're looking for um, early on. Uh, the next couple of weeks, we're starting to work more on strengthening. So ideally, we have that range of motion is progressing. The quadriceps is firing and we can start working on getting, trying to get things stronger. At this stage, you are going to lose some muscle mass. It happens to everybody, but it does come back. It's just a necessary evil with ACLs is that you do lose some quad muscle. And around this phase, we're looking at you're getting the leg all the way straight, and we're getting very close to full flexion. So a little bit off from your other side, but pretty close. <clears throat> uh, six to 10. So this is where... We want people to be more active, but we still are holding you back a little bit. So it's not a, you know, go on hikes on, you know, single track trails, things like that. But you're able to do more exercise, start doing what we call um, open chain or free chain exercises. And ideally at this stage, we're not having pain anymore and we're out of the swelling stage as well. So you're able to start increasing activity. All right, 10 to 16, this is more going to be sports specific. So you're doing, you're starting to working on hops, running, and a little bit of side to side function and motion there. We don't really want you doing exactly cutting, pivoting. Uh, that's again, it's just going to start stressing that ligament out. And it's just simply at this stage, not ready to go. All right, so when we start getting month four to month six, we can start doing more sports specific training. So if you're playing basketball, if you're playing soccer, if you're going skiing, you can start working a little bit more on those hops, the side to side, things along those lines. All right, single leg hop takes a lot of strength, a lot of bounce, a lot of trust. And so that's one of the more difficult things to get people back into doing. But that certainly is helpful for getting back to where we want people to be. 
All right. Um, so when can I get back to doing sports? Right. That's the big question that everyone will ask. The question is always when you're ready. Okay. So when you're ready to get back into doing sports, that's when you can get back into doing sports. And so how do we know that? So what we do is a lower extremity testing protocol. And this is a US ski team again validated metric that we do. Um, <clears throat> so number one measurement. So how big is your quad? How big is your calf? Things like that. And again, we have the other leg that we can compare it to. So we basically will just take a tape measure and just do some measurements. All right. This is what we're looking for. Okay. Not everyone will get to that, but we're looking for your operative side to be within 10% or so of your non-operative side. That just means that we've gotten that strength back up, all right? It, this is one small metric out of the whole metric that we're using. So um, strengthening, body weight squat, lunge, lateral lunge, single leg squat. Again, we have the right versus the left. So we have your operative side versus the non-operative side. So we have something we can very easily compare it to to see how your surgery leg is doing. Balance test. So this is, uh, we have a, a Y-shaped uh, board on the ground and we'll have you put your leg in different directions and see how your balance is. So we have Travis Ganong who recently retired. This is from a couple of years ago, but he'll show us this will work, how the Y test works. All right, here we go. And you can see how he goes that those blocks, you can very easily measure where those blocks go. And that's actually a lot harder than it looks. I can't, I can't do that personally. Then double leg isometric push. So we're looking at how each leg is performing and we'll use uh, force plates to see and measure how much weight you're putting on each leg. So you can do a single leg isometric push, push, double leg isometric push. You can do a plank where you're laying on the right side versus the left side, which will stretch stress each knee more. And you get again, you get an idea of how it's doing compared to, uh, to the other side. And then again, with the force plates, then we can do jumps where you jump down on the plate, you jump off the plate, and then you drop down on the plate as well. And again, here we have Travis showing us just your simple uh, jump on force plate. So there's one on each foot. He's going to jump. And he's attempting to land evenly on both foot. So if we look at this, it's close to get right there, man. fairly similar on both sides. Yeah, that, that was about a 10% difference right there. And again, that's what we're looking for. Um, ideally, you're 92% of the other side. Let's see if we can get the next one. And then oh, we're, stuck, we're stuck in the travel zone. There we go. So here's a counter force jump. You, this is one person, you jump off the box onto a force plate and then jump back up. So it's a more of a compound motion where you you can't try to cheat the test. You're focused more on landing and jumping as opposed to trying to put your weight on either side. So it should be much more of a natural response. And so again, we're looking for pretty even 50-50 weighting on either leg. If you're 90-10, you're certainly favoring your operative leg, not really ready to get back out there to do things. So this is another test that we'll, we'll have people do. And then it, you, it's, it's the next one. Okay, so opt to jump is just, it, it's a um, camera that will record what you're doing. It's just a, another way to make things fancy. Um, the force plates really do show us more of what we're looking for. A uh, single leg hop here, Travis has demonstrated what a single leg hop will look like. Again, we'll repeat that for both sides. That's pretty good. All right, so we have had our injury. We got our surgery done. We did our rehab. It's been six months, maybe six months in a day. We're ready to get back out there. What now can happen, right? What can go wrong at this point? So 
why why do ACL reconstructions fail? Okay, and ideally we think we did a perfect surgery. Ideally we think that we did good rehab. Um, and so some of the factors that we go into surgery knowing younger patients, they have higher activity levels. They tend to push things more. This is not discrimination against younger patients at all, but there, there simply are factors where younger patients do have a higher instance of re-injuries than older patients do. Okay. Um, higher activity levels go along with that as well. And then allograft, and I'm going to uh, clarify this because I don't think it says it, but allograft graphs are only shown to have a higher increase in re-rupture in younger patients. So the number is 23. If you're under the age of 23, typically we recommend using your own tissue. After the age of 23 and beyond, there's not shown to be a difference in re-rupture rates. So that is that definitely needs a qualifier there. Again, more contact and combat sports when you're getting back to doing activities. So football, basketball, soccer, those, you know, have higher instance of re-tear rates. So what does this mean for skiing? Okay, so you certainly do want to pick where you're going to go skiing and how aggressive you're going to be. Okay, so what else can we do with skiing? So number one, do you need a brace to return to skiing? The answer is no, you don't. There's one study done by Bill Sterrett back in the 90s out of the Vail Clinic with Stedman that showed that braces were helpful. There's not been another study that has shown that. And so you don't have to use a brace to return to skiing. However, I do think it's helpful that when you're first getting back into a sport, whether it's skiing, basketball, soccer, football, having a brace to return to sport is almost like having just an extra safety belt when you're relearning your sport. Because when you get back into it after an injury like this, you're not going to be at your same level you were before, at least not in the beginning. So having a brace in the beginning can really help control and give you a little bit more confidence for being back out there. After that first season, if you're done with the brace and want to ski without it, you're not putting yourself at increased risk in that way. And this just goes to show that that the instances, nothing was statistically significant. So the, bra the braces were not really shown. And then here with the steroid stock um, braced, they didn't have ACL reconstruction. The non-braced ones did. So again, not statistically significant, but that's that was what they showed there. So it was an underpowered study. Uh, there was a return to sport after ACLs for X game skiers and snowboarders. Uh, this was back in 2012, 15 skiers, 10 snowboarders who underwent ACL reconstructions. Uh, they went back to return the eight into the X Games, or at least 80% of them did. And then they won. The skiers did just as well after surgery as they had done historically before surgery. The snowboarders actually did better after their surgery. And so the snowboarders were actually more competitive afterwards. So return to sports and return to activities, very successful with these ACLs. And this just breaks that down, that before and after everyone did just as well, if not better. So this is not a career ending injury at this stage anymore. You have an ACL injury, we can get you back to where you want to be. We have a high likelihood of getting you back to where you want to be. So which then begs the question, how do we avoid ending up there in the first place? Right. We don't want to you don't want to come to the office. You want to be out having fun. So neuromuscular training program. So keeping the leg strong, keeping your core strong, and then really staying in balance and having good control is important. So currently there's many programs in development. This is a very big thing that a lot of high schools are doing. A lot of youth soccer, football, skiing programs are doing, uh, which certainly decrease risks in, in young athletes and keeps them out of the hospital. So for example, learning how when you land, you want to keep your knees apart and keep them straight. If your knee buckles to the inside, you get a concern that it's going to start to twist. And that again will put start putting stress on that ACL and you can start to develop risk of it having an injury. So <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Dr. Julie Hubbard uh, has a website where she goes over all of this. And I'm going to show you some of these this is soccer girl props. So again, if you're going to do a lunge, 
You want your knee straight up and down. Don't let your knee turn to the inside. It's very easy to develop bad habits if you're not paying attention. Same thing when you're standing, knee straight. Don't let your knees bend in. When you're doing a squat, you want to keep your knees apart and keep them solid. Don't let your knees buckle into the inside. And if you're doing a single leg, again, very important to keep your legs straight up and down. Don't let it buckle to the inside also. Uh, this is just for core exercise for working on your hamstrings, keeping your torso nice and straight, not bending over at the waist. It's just good technique. So in summary, your ACL controls anterior motion, but it also controls rotation. That's an important point to remember. Uh, often your knee is at risk if it's fully extended or fully flexed and you have a twisting mechanism to it. All right? Not everyone needs surgery, but there's a high recommendation for surgery, particularly with active people. If you're gonna have a surgery, you need to do physical therapy. It will just improve outcomes, in return, improve return to sport, return to activity. It's, it's a must. Again, it's ACL injuries. It's not career ending. We get people back to doing what they want to do. And so that there's a method back to where you want to be. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, we've already had a couple of questions come in, but as a reminder, if you do have questions, you can ask them in the Q and a box or the chat box. Or you can even try raising your hand and we can try it that way. Um, so the first question is, do you recommend CPM use after surgery or is that a thing of the past? So CPM is a thing of the past at, at, at home. Again, so some places at physical therapy spots, they'll have someone in a CPM just to get you a little bit of a warm up to get loose while you first get there. And so CPM machines can be helpful, but you don't need to have a CPM in your home. Great. The second question is, do most patients purchase the ice cooler for home use? If so, how long do they typically use it? So you have the ice machines and um, <clears throat> that's a very good question. So I would say majority of people either buy them or they have a friend who has one. And so they'll borrow them. The ice machine is typically very important for the first one to two weeks using it up to about six weeks isn't a bad idea. So that can be a little bit more, but if you feel that you need it, it's not causing any harm. There's also uh, something called a game ready. A lot of physical therapy places have game ready so that will provide cooling and it will also provide some compression as well. And you can program it so you can actually program it through the night so you can sleep with it on. And again, th those aren't supported by insurance. So that is a cost addition to having these surgeries. So it's not a requirement. It's certainly something that people do appreciate and enjoy having, but just using plain old ice and putting it on, taking it off every 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off will also do the trick. Okay, next question. Um, this person's husband had an ACL reconstruction, not in Tahoe, about two and a half years ago. It's still painful and feels tight. He seems to favor his other leg when walking, but he can mountain bike ride and swim. Um, this many years later, is it worth considering MUA, any special PT or other non-surgical solutions that might help? Good question. So a lot of that depends on what the range of motion is. So if you're getting the leg all the way straight, getting it all the way bent, there's no catching, locking, no instability. So it, just, it feels tight and it's not as strong as you would like it to. That's something that physical therapy could certainly address. If we're lacking some motion or we're lacking some stability, then typically we'll get an MRI first. An MRI does not mean automatic surgery. An MRI simply is letting you see exactly what's going on. So if you have decreased motion, if you can't get the leg all the way straight, you may have some scar tissue that's blocking that. And that's good to know. Same thing if you're lacking flexion, you might have some scar tissue holding that up as well. And these are things that we can see on an MRI or get an idea what's going on so that we can give good advice as to yes, therapy will be helpful or no, therapy is not going to break down that scar tissue. We can do surgery to maybe remove it. So basically getting a little bit more of an accurate diagnosis would be the first step. So if you had the surgery a couple of years ago, following with the surgeon who did that surgery would be the first step. 
Great. Uh, I think this is the last question. So if you do have a question you want to ask, oh, we got a couple more. Um, just make sure to get it in there and I'll ask on your behalf. Um, would an ACL repair be recommended three years after the injury with no impairments or pain? Good question. It, if you're not having pain and you're doing all the activities that you want to do and the knee doesn't bother you, then I probably would not recommend for an ACL reconstruction. The reason being that if you have enough strength, muscular control that your body is compensating for your ACL being torn, then we're not gonna provide a benefit with an ACL surgery. Okay, and there is a question about the air, uh, I'm sorry, the bare implant. You might mm -hmm. have mentioned it, but can you repeat who is a good candidate for the bare implant? Absolutely. So. Bare implant, you want to do your surgery within 50 days. So it needs to basically be a fresh tear. And <clears throat> essentially, the official recommendations for a bare implant is if you have a one centimeter stump of ACL left, you can use a bare implant and the, the implant itself will bridge or create a scaffold for the rest of that ACL to grow back. I tend to err towards, I'd like the ACL to bridge at least over half of the gap between the tibia and the femur so that there's less room for it to grow into. So you can get a good sense on the MRI if someone has quite a bit of residual ACL that they can use or if you don't have a usable ACL. So again, um, fresh injury under 50 days and having enough residual ACL stump that it, you can use it for a repair. Great. I don't see any other questions, but again, if you want to sneak one in, I'll, I'll still ask it. Um, but I'll start to wrap things up. Thank you again for being here. Um, we do send out a post webinar survey. It just gives us good insight into how we're doing and what future topics you'd like to see. We, we definitely rely on that feedback. Um, and also as a reminder, this, uh, webinar has been recorded so you can either view it on our YouTube channel, or you can look on our Facebook channel and you will find it there. Um, but I think with that, I don't see any other questions. I'm going to go ahead and give you all about six minutes back to your night. And thank you again so much, Dr. Orr, for being here and for pro providing all this great information. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks.